As you can see, uh, the talk has essentially three parts. The first and third parts address themselves to the nature of philosophy. The second part is an interpolation uh, and is the secondary theme of the lecture, and that is the role of philosophy in a university. So I start then addressing the question of the nature of philosophy. In many ways, the best way to explain what philosophy is, and in fact the way that I usually resort to at parties if I can't excuse myself in the conversation on the grounds that my drink is empty, empty is uh, to give examples. Examples of the kinds of problems that philosophers deal with. For example, much is made today of the humble computing machine. Some have thought that there is, in principle, no human cognitive activity that it cannot perform. Indeed, some have gone so far as to suggest that people are essentially such computing machines. Is that right? A second example. Many have claimed that they have a right to an abortion. Many others have claimed they have a right to stop others having abortion. Who's right? And what's all this talk of rights anyway? The nature of time provides a multitude of problems. Would it pass if nothing changed? Or if there were no conscious beings? And how can time itself, the measure of passage, itself pass? One final example will, will do. Many assume that democracy is the best form of government. But why should the fact that a majority of people think that a person or group should govern be a reason to let them? After all, you hardly want to base a medical decision on a majority decision of the uh, yeah, a medical decision on a majority decision of the population. So what makes a political decision at all different if it is? So much for examples. Examples such as these may be illuminating, but as an account of philosophy, they leave something to be desired. Examples can indicate the area which is philosophy, but they cannot specify what it is. To do that, we need a definition. What kind of definition do we need, however? Since Aristotle, it's been customary to divide and distinguish between real definitions and nominal definitions. Nominal definitions are about language. They specify the meaning of a word or a phrase. For example, the word bachelor means an unmarried man of eligible age. Real definitions, by contrast, are not about language, but about things themselves and specify their natures. For example, the definitions of chemical elements in terms of their atomic numbers are real definitions. Thus, gold is the chemical element with atomic number 79. Notice that this hardly captures the meaning of the word gold. The word was meaningful before the notion of atomic number was thought of. It gives, however, a characterization of the stuff gold itself by stating its essential characteristic. Now, in seeking a definition of philosophy, I'm not seeking a nominal definition. What the word means is of little interest. What I'm after is a real definition, something that tells us what philosophy itself is, that is, which specifies its nature. But though it's not a nominal definition that I'm after, perhaps the place to start to look for a definition is with the etymology of the word philosophy. The Greek philosophia, from which philosophy derives, is often translated as the love of wisdom. However, this, I'm assured, is a poor translation. The Greek sophia means something like the exercise of intelligence or intellectual curiosity and can be used to apply to fields as widely different as cosmology and carpentry. Hence, the etymology of the world, word is of little use here. Many philosophers have offered a definition of philosophy. The trouble is, they've offered many quite different definitions. In fact, there's an old, an old joke that if you have ten historians in a room and ask them to pronounce on some issue, you'll get five different answers. If you have ten economists in a room and ask them to pronounce on this issue, you'll get ten different answers. If you have ten philosophers in a room and ask them to pronounce, you'll get twenty different answers. <laughs> However, one kind of definition that's been offered uh, draws its rationale from some philosophical theory or, or other. Thus, for example, Plato identified philosophy with the study of the forms, and Hegel thought it was a certain phase in the development of Geist. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't know what these are. The problem with these definitions is not so much that the theories on which they're based are false, though they are that, 
is that a definition of a subject should not presuppose any substantive theory within the subject itself. We'd not accept a definition of physics, for example, which enshrined a particular conception of matter, be that particles, waves, or the Aristotelian elements. Rather, physics is the study of matter, whatever that should turn out to be in the end. In a similar way, a definition of philosophy should be theory neutral. Some disciplines, such as physics, can, as I've indicated, be characterised in terms of a distinctive subject matter. Some philosophers have thought that philosophy can be similarly defined. For example, the view that mind and matter are totally distinct kinds of things rose to prominence in the 18th century. This suggested to numerous people that matter was the domain of the physical sciences, or natural philosophy as it was called until very recently, and that mind was the domain of philosophy, or moral sciences, as it was called until very recently in Cambridge. Thus, philosophy could perhaps be defined as the study of the distinctively mental, that is, of things human. Thus, Mill, for example, in his uh, essay August Comte and Positivism, defined philosophy as the scientific study of man. Now, even setting aside the chauvinism of this definition, its shortcomings are too obvious to need labouring. Not only is there much to the study of humanity, which is not philosophy, as the disciplines of sociology and psychology show us, but there are many philosophical problems that have nothing specifically to do with humanity. And this is particularly true of the philosophical problems thrown up by concepts in the natural science, such as those about time that I mentioned. Rather than define philosophy in terms of a distinctive subject matter, some philosophers have tried to define it in terms of the possession of some distinctive method. Just as some have wanted to define science in terms of what's called the scientific method, whatever that is. The most recent attempt at such an account is probably the last which held any orthodoxy in the English-speaking philosophical world, and was to the effect that philosophy proceeded by linguistic analysis. What exactly this meant was a point of some disagreement. It meant, for example, rather different things to its most notable proponents, Russell, Carnap, Wittgenstein, Austin. However, in Nuke, the central thought is that in some sense, Philosophical problems are linguistic and are to be solved by analysing the structure of discourse. Now, philosophy has learnt a lot from linguistic analysis. Certainly, getting clear about what exactly the issues are is an essential part of any philosophical investigation. And the much lampooned reply, it depends what you mean, is a necessary first step in many investigations. But it is, at best, only a first step. Information about language cannot provide an answer to substantial and clarified questions about the nature of thought, time, or rights, as most philosophers would now agree, in virtue of the fact that linguistic philosophy has just failed to deliver the goods. Nor is there any reason to suppose that the modern continental form of the endeavour, deconstruction, will ultimately fare any better. I repeat, if you ask questions about language, you will get answers about language. If you want to answer questions about what language talks about, then you must ask about that. Well, so far we've learned little about philosophy from the definitions that I've considered. I want now to consider two other definitions which are also wrong, but, which, but from which one can learn very important things. And some of these things I'm going to flag for future reference because I shall return to them. A most interesting definition is offered by the eminent Australian philosopher John Passmore in his article on the topic in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Passmore defines philosophy as the theory of critical discussion. What he means by this is not that philosophy what he means by this is that philosophy is concerned with the analysis and evaluations of the reasons that are offered for various positions in science, mathematics, religion, morality, politics, art, or wherever. He doesn't mean that philosophers are concerned to evaluate whether the latest proof of Gödel's theorem is correct or if the latest arguments for social justice hold water. Though they may do this too. 
Rather, it means that philosophy is concerned with the various kinds of arguments that are offered for various kinds of conclusions. What exactly they are, how they function, and whether or not they really are good reasons. Now, there are two very important aspects of philosophy that Passmore's account throws into prominence. The first is that philosophy is essentially critical. This is the first point I'm going to flag. This is one of the things that distinguishes philosophy from religion, politics, and normal science, in the sense of uh, Tom Kuhn, the historian of science. Nothing is sacrosanct. Everything is fair game for challenge. It must defend itself or go under. The second aspect that Passmore's account throws into prominence is that philosophy has a symbiotic relationship with other disciplines. It draws many of its central issues from other areas, such as physics, psychology, law, literature, and so on. And in return, it provides for them a critique of their methods, canons of argument, and fundamental beliefs, which spur on the long-term development of those subjects. But despite these things, I think that Passmore, Passmore's account is wrong. It takes account of what we might call the analytic side of philosophy, that is, its critical and evaluative aspects, but it ignores what we might call the synthetic side, because philosophy is also a strongly imaginative and creative subject, and this is the second point that I flag. Philosophers have produced some of the most ingenious and important theories in Western thought. Sometimes the theories become, deservedly or undeservedly, mere history. More importantly, sometimes the theories are taken up by later disciplines to provide bases for important developments. Thus, in science, atomism and positivism. Positivism played an important role in both the special theory of relativity and psychological behaviorism. Both these things, uh, atomism and positivism, to name just a couple from a long list, were first thought of by philosophers. In politics, the ideas of Hobbes, Locke and Marx have all been made the bases of political systems. In art, the Romantic movement of the 19th century owed much to the Romantic philosophy of Rousseau, Coleridge and others. And so it goes on. Indeed, as Passmore himself said in a recent interview in the Bulletin, uh, and I quote, almost all the ideas which we now take for granted came from philosophy. Passmore's definition, because of his own words, seems to me to do no justice to this creative aspect of philosophy. To understand the other illuminating but incorrect account of philosophy that I want to talk about, it is necessary to look at the historical development of Western thought. It's a striking fact that philosophy is the area out of which nearly all other more specialised intellectual inquiries that we now recognise sprang. And this is the third point that I flag. They each broke away from philosophy when they developed specialised methods appropriate to dealing with the objects of their inquiry. Mathematics was the first breakaway in about the 3rd century BC. Pythagoras was as much philosopher as mathematician. Euclid was not. Astronomy broke away about the 2nd century AD with Ptolemy. Physics and the other natural sciences broke away in the early 19th century, sorry, 17th century at the times of Galileo and Descartes. And sociology, psychology, economics and so on broke away in the 19th century. And so it went. We're currently witnessing philosophy give birth to literary theory. And what subjects will follow is anyone's guess. It's interesting to note that logic, which could have broken away at any time after the 3rd century BC, has retained its central locus in philosophy, despite its forging alliances with other disciplines. But why this is, I'm not going to speculate here. This, I suppose, raises the question of whether philosophy will eventually wither away in favour of more specialist disciplines. Such an optimistic view, or maybe pessimistic depending on who you are, is, I think, groundless. Human thought, creative and untidy, is unlikely ever to allow itself to be neatly tailored into such procrustean beds. If only because, as I've already noted, the relationship between philosophy and the special sciences is a dialectical one, the sciences themselves posing new philosophical pro problems as they develop. Be all this as it may, this historical perspective suggests another definition of philosophy. In the first chapter of Some Problems of Philosophy, William James, the American philosopher, reviewing the development that I just noted, 
remarks that philosophy is but the residuum of questions unanswered. James' actual remark is wrong. There are many purely scientific questions that are unanswered. You can take your pick from quantum physics, cosmology, evolutionary theory or economics and a host of others. And many purely philosophical questions have been definitively answered. For example, all the traditional versions of, say, the ontological argument for the existence of God are agreed to be unsound. However, the spirit of James' remark seems sound. Philosophical questions are those that are not within the scope or the methods of more specialised inquiries. And this is the fourth and final point that I shall flag. Perhaps this can provide a definition of philosophy. Unfortunately not. For a very simple reason. As the ancient canons of definition tell us, you can't define something by saying what it's not. To define something is to say what it is. And no amount of saying what it's not can do this. Obviously, I can't define gold by saying that it's not iron, and it's not copper, and it's not whatever. Indeed, the fact that philosophy has given birth to most other theoretical inquiries cannot provide the basis of a definition of philosophy. It's a fact that it itself cries out for explanation, presumably in terms of the nature of philosophy. So far, then, in the search for a definition of philosophy, we've drawn a blank. We've already seen enough, however, for me to take up the secondary theme of this lecture, the role of a philosophy, the role of philosophy in a university, to which I now turn. And I will return to the question of the nature of philosophy after the interpolation. And just to help you follow where I'm getting to, I'll put this back up. We're now in part two. Universities have three prime functions and, correlatively, three prime responsibilities. And I shall argue that philosophy is important, indeed essential, to each of these. The first is research. The first function of a university is to research, and the correlative responsibility is to the subject researched. There's no older academic discipline than philosophy. This has always been a prime area of research in universities. Moreover, it's important to remember that universities now bear the sole responsibility for research in philosophy. Gone are the days when either the church or private incomes provided for the livelihood of philosophers. If the universities of the world closed their philosophy departments, philosophy wouldn't cease. The fascination of the human mind for some of the most profound problems that can be posed will ever outstrip local institutional arrangements. However, organised research in philosophy would cease. For this reason, if no other, universities have a responsibility to ensure the existence of thriving philosophy departments. However, the importance of research in philosophy far outstrips its own local confines. As I pointed out, historically, philosophy has functioned as the mother of theoretical inquiries, giving birth to them all. If we wish new areas or disciplines to emerge, and there is no reason to smugly assume that all that there can be already are, research in philosophy is essential to provide the matrix out of which they may arise. Secondly, and as I've already noted, research in special areas, once they have evolved, does not decouple itself from philosophy. Fundamental problems are thrown back to philosophy for analysis, and philosophers are in the ideal position to perform this service. First, because of their training and cr critical scrutiny. Secondly, because they're willing to question things which practitioners of the special areas are not themselves prepared to question at that time. And third, because they're prepared to suggest fruitful, speculative ideas that someone deeply ingrained in the subject is unlikely to countenance. The historian of science, Tom Kuhn, I've already mentioned, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, observed that philosophy has played an important role in all the revolutions in the natural sciences. His point would have been equally valid for revolutions in psychology, politics, or whatnot. The second function of a university is to teach, and the correlative responsibility is to its students. In one respect, this is but a corollary of the previous function. You can't have research in a subject unless you train researchers. However, few people who are undergraduates at this university or any other will become researchers. What then are they doing here? Part of the answer is that they're here to absorb a body of information, which they'll go then out into the wider world and apply. 
but this is only a part of the story, however, and a smaller part than many would think. If this were all there were to teaching, there would be a much more cost-effective way of going about it. We could just create a battery hen university. The rest of the story is that universities should produce thoughtful, mature, rational, well-rounded people who are capable of living their lives to the full and enriching those of others. If someone can leave a university without having had the opportunity to think about the existence of God, various moral problems, such as abortion, the rights and wrongs of the political system in which they live, the nature of the physical universe in which they live, in short, in philosophy, then that university has failed its students. In an ideal world, all students would, perhaps, take courses which require them to think about these issues. However, this is not an ideal world, as I need hardly remind you. Time is a scarce commodity, but even in a less than ideal world, students may attend open discussions, seminars, debates on these issues, provided only that they are available. And they should be available in any university worth its salt. There was a debate in the uh, correspondence columns of the Australian about six months ago on whether the new universities being renamed in Australia are real universities. And the centre of the debate seemed to have become whether or not they could be real universities without any philosophical presence. And there was uh, a letter from one of the heads of these institutions, whom I now forget, who pointed out that real universities didn't need to have a philosophical presence because there were some quite bona fide universities which didn't have a philosophical presence. For example, there was the um, University of Padua in the uh, 12th century. <laughs> Point made. Thus, philosophy should play an integral role in both the formal and the informal educational life of a university. The third function of a university is to be the locus of certain social resources and the correlative responsibility is to society. In a sense, this too is a corollary of the previous point. As I said then, it is a function of a university to produce people who can enrich the lives of others, and doing so is precisely fulfilling one's responsibilities to society. This is done in many ways, and I attempt no exhaustive list. But first, people at universities are able to help others appreciate their cultural heritage, be this philosophy, literature, or science. Secondly, they can actually create this cultural heritage. Amongst the humanities, philosophy is quite unique in this respect. Writers are rarely to be found in English departments. Few people in music departments are composers. But with few exceptions, creative philosophers are found in and only in university philosophy departments. Next, people at universities have an important role to play in social commentary and criticism, be this through the media, government commissions, moves for social and legal reform, and so on. Now, philosophers have an important role to play in these things, for usually they've thought about the issues professionally and, just as importantly, have no special interests to protect. Moreover, they're good social critics for exactly the same reasons that they're good critics in general. They have both highly developed critical skills and are prepared to float novel ideas. Of course, this may make them unpopular sometimes. I've yet to see a government that welcomed criticism, which is why the independence of the universities from outside power groups, most notably the government, is absolutely crucial to fulfilling this social role. Notice that I've not used the words national interest yet. This is quite deliberate. The social responsibilities of a university go far beyond the parochial consideration of which nation houses it. The kinds of responsibility I've just been talking about are to all humanity. National governments are, of course, agents whose function is precisely to protect national interests. Another reason why universities will fail if their function, fail in their function if they allow themselves to be dictated to by governments. Of course, universities do have responsibilities to the national interest. For example, criticising a nation or a state because it has irrational drug laws or sexist institutional policies or short-sighted environmental policies are all in the national interest. I observe that none of these is a matter of economic interest. Indeed, they may run against economic interest. 
And I take this opportunity to lament the fact that the phrase national interest has been hijacked by politicians and their bureaucrats to mean economic interest, a fact that social critics would do well to stress. Interests far outrun and often outweigh purely economic interests. Still, universities have some responsibility to the national economic interests too, as, of course, the government never ceases uh, tiring, uh, never tires of, tires of telling us. Taxpayers have the right to expect some sort of economic return for their money. And here, at last, we appear to have found an area of university function in which philosophy is relatively unimportant. Have we? No. And this is for two reasons. The first is that the training of philosophy students makes them high-level contributors in employment, as a couple of recent uh, reports show. The first is by the British Royal Institute of Philosophy and was published in 1986, and it demonstrates that philosophy graduates may take longer to settle into a profession than other graduates, being more discriminating, but within a couple of years of graduation, their level of employment is high compared with other non-professional graduates. Philosophy graduates also report an unusually high level of job satisfaction. The second report is by the study group on the conditions of excellence in American higher education, which was published in 1985, which reports that philosophy majors perform substantially better than average on each of the standard tests for admission to graduate schools in the United States, and that not a single other group of majors shows such a consistent high level of achievement. This indicates a high level of those general skills sought after by American employers, the ability to think rigorously, express oneself clearly, analyze situations and arguments, and come up with creative problem solutions. Actually, these reports are always very strange things. I, I thought I'd share this with you. Um, th this report, this is the Royal Institute one, uh, has some quotations which it picked out from replies. And uh, one person, I don't know who's a man or a woman, said uh, as far as, since studying philosophy, I've never been feared to tackle technical matters and consequently have tackled many subjects which others shy away from because they fear the jargon. My complete confidence in being able to tackle technical matters and incomprehensible jargon can be traced directly back to my study of Descartes himself. <laughs> I don't think you've ever heard of Hegel. The second reason that uh, philosophy is important to economic interests is that although research in philosophy rarely provides short-term money makers, it may bear important and unforeseen economic consequences further down the track. For example, the theoretical basis of computing was worked out by logicians such as Gödel and Church before the first electronic computer was even, computer was even thought of and the philosophical speculations of Niels Bohr about the nature of matter eventu eventuated in the uh, transistor and the microchip. Right now, the traditional philosophical subject of epistemology is finding applications in artificial intelligence that were not dreamt of 20 years ago. Thus, even where you might least expect to find it, philosophy plays a crucial role in the functioning and responsibility of universities. I end this section with an aside. This is a good opportunity to say these things because uh, I have a captive audience and you can't come back at me. As we've seen, there are important reasons why the responsibilities of a university differ inherently from those of a government, particularly those of a government that's on the next election. It is, therefore, crucial that those running our universities bear this firmly in mind when determining policy and practice in the light of government economic pressure they must realise that what is in the best short-term economic interest of their own particular university may not be in the best interest of the university system or the economy as a whole, as studies of coordination pro pro problems quite clearly demonstrate. For example, if each vice-chancellor decides to maximise government funding in his or her own institution by developing those areas nominated as short-term priority areas, the result on a national level will be a general and unintended atrophy of other areas, such as philosophy, other areas which are essential both to the university system as a whole and long-term economic development. The leaders of our universities need to be clear, courageous and work cooperatively. 
They also require the support and the solidarity of all university staff. This is something that the government appears to appreciate since it's taken steps to destroy it. With a familiar strategy of divide and conquer, their actions have been aimed to dismantle the collegial structure of universities and to replace it with a divisive, hierarchical and quite inappropriate corporal, corporal, corporate structure. I say again, the universities have a responsibility that far outruns the parochial short-term interests of any particular national government. If we don't stand up for this, collectively and determinedly, the result will be that we sell our birthright for a mess of pottage. <coughs> so ends the interpolation. I now return to the main theme of this talk, which is the nature of philosophy. Having sounded this toxin, and with perhaps some sense of anticlimax, um, what is philosophy itself? Earlier, I examined a number of possible definitions of philosophy and rejected them as inadequate. So, let me make a fresh start. How should one define something? A standard answer, going back as far as Plato, is that one should proceed by the method of genus and differentia. We first say what kind of thing something is, that is, give it genus, and we then say what species of this kind it is by giving a differentia, something which differentiates it from other species of the same genus. So let me proceed thus. Fairly clearly, philosophy is a kind of inquiry, or better, theoretical inquiry, since philosophy goes beyond mere fact collection. It formulates and evaluates theories about many kinds of things. But what kind of theoretical inquiry is it? What differentiates it from other such inquiries? That's the question. The key to an answer has in fact already passed before you. I've been discussing the nature of philosophy, and in doing so, I have myself been doing philosophy. For the nature of philosophy is itself a philosophical issue. In this, philosophy would seem to be quite unique. The nature of mathematics is not itself a mathematical issue. In fact, it's a philosophical one. The nature of history is not a historical issue. In fact, it too is a philosophical one. As far as I can see, there is no inquiry other than philosophy, the discussion of the nature of which falls within the scope of that inquiry. This, then, is the differentia that I suggest. And I knew something would go wrong. Well, I was going to put the definition up before you. However, I can't find the slide, so you'll have to hold it in your memories, all right? I'm going to call an inquiry the nature of which falls within its own scope self-reflexive. So an inquiry is self-reflexive if it itself, or its own nature, is a subject of that very inquiry. And I suggest that philosophy is that theoretical inquiry which is self-reflexive. The main doubt, it seems to me, about the adequacy of this definition is that self-reflexivity, whilst it may state an essential property of philosophy, doesn't state a fundamental one. For example, it may be admitted that philosophy is self-reflexive, but argued that this is so only because philosophy has the more fundamental property of being the subject that discusses the nature of all theoretical inquiries. Now, it may be the case that philosophy studies the nature of all theoretical inquiries, though I doubt this. For example, the nature of entomology, for example, hardly seems a philosophical issue. Hardly seems an issue at all, in fact. However, I do take the general point. A definition must pick out not just an essential property of something, but in some sense, a fundamental essential property. And the differentia that I suggested does not appear to be very fundamental. But stop and ask for a moment what it means to say that a differentia is fundamental. Consider again the definition of gold as the element of atomic number 79. What makes atomic number a good differentia is that it is the essential property from which a substance's other properties follow. Once we know the atomic number of an element, we can determine, given the appropriate background theory, its chemical properties, such as valency, and even many of its physical properties, such as melting point. Now, it seems to me that self-reflexivity is a fundamental property of philosophy in just this sense. 
For from it, one can infer numerous other features of philosophy, including the ones that I flagged just now. And thank goodness I lost that one. Here they were. So what I shall now argue is that self-reflexivity entails each of these other properties, the ones I flagged. Suppose that an inquiry is self-reflexive. Then, prior to the inquiry, we have no independent fix on the nature of its object. But if we have no such fix, then we have no fix on either the fundamental assumptions or the special methods of the inquiry, because one can't know the appropriate methods for investigating something until one has a pretty good idea of what it is. In other words, a self-reflexive inquiry must bootstrap itself into existence, both in terms of its objects and its methods. Thus, such an inquiry, unlike other inquiries, can have neither fundamental assumptions nor specialised methods. But just this is true of philosophy, as I've already pointed out, and this is the fourth of the topics, fourth of the issues there. Philosophical questions are those that are not within the scope of the methods of more specialised inquiries. All other inquiries, science or history or anthropology, proceed against a background of shared assumptions, just because the, the subject is constituted as a special science with determinate shape. Philosophy is not constituted in this way. Moreover, the lack of doctrinal and particular methodological constraints in philosophy explains why it is the imaginative subject it is, where any hypothesis may be seriously put up, which is the second uh, of the points flagged. Philosophy is strongly imaginative and creative. Conversely, since its only way of controlling unbridled speculation is criticism, which is not, note, a special method, but something common to all forms of inquiry, this explains why the critical aspects of philosophy are so well developed. Point number one, philosophy is essentially critical. Finally, it now becomes clear why other disciplines broke away from philosophy, which is the third of these points. Philosophy is the area out of which nearly all the more specialised intellectual inquiries that we now recognise sprang. Because one thing that can result from a philosophical inquiry is the basic assumptions and appropriate methods for investigating some subject or other. Because these must, after all, come from somewhere. When these are found, they constitute a new subject which then divorces itself from philosophy. So, what I've tried to show is that the self-reflexive nature of philosophy explains numerous of its features. Its lack of special method and assumptions, its creativity, its critical nature, and its historical fecundity. Hence, it seems to me to be very appropriate to take self-reflexivity to be a quite fundamental property of philosophy. And this justifies defining philosophy addition for a definition, the thought's mistaken. A definition of truth, as, say, correspondence with reality, when suitably fleshed out, is similarly useless for determining whether something is true. And the definition of gold, as something with atomic number 79, is of little use in determining whether something is gold. The familiar bank, a practical test, is much more useful. If you wish to know whether or not something is a philosophical question, there's no better way than to see whether you find yourself doing philosophy when considering it. And the experience is, I assure you, quite unmistakable. And the only way we can learn what this experience is like is to get used to doing it with examples. That is why giving examples is, I think, the most effective way of getting someone to understand what philosophy is. So perhaps I'll stick to that at parties. I finish with a quotation from Aristotle, since this is philosophy. <laughs> Aristotle, in the Metaphysics, said as follows. He said all of that. Perfect thought apprehends and thinks its object in such a way that the thought and its object become one. And the thought thus becomes its own object. Now, as those of you who know your Aristotle will recognise, I'm sure, uh, in this passage, Aristotle takes himself to be describing God. I think he got it wrong. He is, in fact, describing philosophy. 